Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Help support this network and become a member. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash members for details. It's just $7.99 USD per month or save on an annual membership. That's arcpodnet.com slash members to support education and outreach. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 172. On today's show, we talk about, review, and critique the movie The Lost City. Let's dig a little deeper and find the crown of fire. Wait, don't turn off the show. This is actually going to be good. I I know the intro said we're talking about a movie, a kind of a dumb (laughs) movie, but please don't turn this off because it'll be interesting, I swear. I don't think it was that dumb. Well, it was a little dumb. (laughs) It was was entertaining. It was entertaining. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start with our little update because we have an interesting update, I think, for the first time in TAS history, as far as you being the co-host goes. Yeah. We are on literally separate coasts and we're probably about the same distance from the ocean in both our respective locations. Yeah, I'm in North Carolina in my hometown of Charlotte visiting my family and you mm-hmm. are still back in Washington, where I left you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're both essentially in our birthplaces. Like, I was born here in Monroe, yeah, and you are. were born in Charlotte. Yeah, that's yeah. actually kind of weird. So, but, yeah. you know, there's just family stuff going on, and it's just easier for me to go by myself when you have to fly all the way across the country. And I figured mm-hmm. if I was going, I might as well stay for a couple of weeks because we remote work, and there's nowhere I needed to be, like, with you. So... You're going to continue on with the RV and I'll hang out here with my baby nieces. Yeah, you don't need to be with me. It's okay moving a 26,000 pound house in a car by yourself. (laughs) It's no big deal. Whatever. (laughs) You told me it would be fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be just Uh fine. Oh my God, now I'm worried. (laughs) I know, I know. So this is going to be interesting because you have wanted to watch this movie just from an entertainment standpoint. It's the the movie we're talking about is called The Lost City. And... Mm -hmm. It's out on, I I mean, it was in the theaters a few months ago, but we watched it on Paramount Plus, I think, on the app Paramount Plus. Yeah. Do you know if it's available anywhere else? I did not see anywhere else. I tried to look and I haven't seen it on any other streaming services. So Mm -hmm. it seems like because it just came out in like March and now it's already on streaming. It must be like a special deal they have with Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just texted me last night because we hadn't really planned this and said, you're going to watch this movie and you're you're at your parents' house. (laughs) You're watching it with them. Uh Uh-huh. And then I was like, all right, well, fine. I'll I'll watch it. That sounds good to me. I mean, I actually had another thing planned for recording today, but I was like, this is fun. Let's just do it while it's fresh in our minds and, and, yeah. and get this thing recorded. So, And I'll be totally honest here. My dad, who is uh, 68-ish, literally mm-hmm. fell asleep five and a half minutes in. Five and a half. Snoring logs over there. So it wasn't his favorite movie. <laughs> But your dad doesn't really set the bar high for not falling asleep while watching TV. It could be <laughs> that is it could be accurate. one o'clock in the afternoon and he'll just fall asleep watching his favorite show. That's accurate. That is accurate. <laughs> yeah. Unless it's talking heads on Fox, then he's wide awake. But all ears. That yeah. is a whole different story. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully he doesn't listen to this podcast. So let's talk about <laughs> <laughs> No chance. Zero chances. <laughs> He doesn't even know what a podcast is. <laughs> That's right. Let's talk about the movie. So it stars yeah. uh, Sandra Horseface Bullock. And oh, come on. She's beautiful. You're so mean. Channing Fabio Tatum. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've never really liked Sandra Bullock. Um, but this movie, I thought she she played basically herself, I feel like. But she played she played herself really well. She played yeah. the Sandra Bullock character that she usually plays you know relatively well it wasn't super annoying it was a little bit self-deprecating and yeah. you know just humorous and i and i like that 
Yeah, she's she's basically a famous romance author, romance and adventure yeah. author in this fictional land. And right. I think that might actually parallel her real life a little bit, even though she's an, an actor instead mm-hmm. of an author. But still, like, she's famous and she's having a hard time in the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. The the little bit of backstory that you learn, I mean, kind of right out of the gate, but then you kind of get this throughout the movie. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't seen it, like go ahead and pause this and oh yeah, stop see right it now. and go because we're just going to tell you everything that happens. Yeah, like, probably by the end like of this segment. A whole plot totally spoiled. Yeah. here we go. Hundred percent happening. <laughs> but keep in mind, we're not really blowing the movie for you. It's still. It, it's a c- action comedy, so it's still yeah, funny. It's funny, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a good waste of time. I mean, there's some really good butt shots. I'm just saying, oh my like, God. G- just stick around oh for the butt shots. That's God. all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna tell you which butt. You don't even know, but there's butt shots. You know, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you wouldn't be saying it if you didn't know. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. Anyway, so mm-hmm. this movie again we're gonna we're gonna tell you all about it and it starts out basically with her she clearly had a she herself and they didn't really talk about this as much but she had like an academic background right and she was married to an archaeologist who died some years ago right and Mm -hmm. she took this like failed academic textbook kind of thing she was trying to write she couldn't get anybody to publish it and essentially Mm -hmm. decided to write a romance novel instead on a whim Mm -hmm. and it became wildly successful (laughs) that's yeah like i think her main character might even be an archaeologist in the romance novel i think so yeah because it's like an adventure it's an indiana jones adventure archaeology Mm -hmm. type of fiction and she kind of seemed like she was sort of fictionalizing her own life and relationship just a little bit in her books. Yeah. So kind of fiction within a fiction. <laughs> yeah. And the young uh, Channing Tatum, who goes by Alan, his character in the book is called Dash. Although it, the really one of the funny aspects of this throughout is like he sees <laughs> yeah. himself almost like a movie character, but he's yeah. literally just on the cover. Like he was hired as the, yeah. as the like the Fabio cover looking cover model. <laughs> But he's like has no other connection to the book aside from that. There is no movies, yeah. apparently. There's no nothing. But, it's just the cover. <laughs> but there's 20 books in the series. So women just yeah. have seen his face on these books over the years. And they're just like, they throw themselves at him. So he's almost as famous yeah. as she is just for being on the cover. So she, well, yeah, and- like you might expect, is not super thrilled about that or him or the shirt ripping off that he tends to do when on stages and around her. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 So real quick, one of the ways we're going to structure this podcast right here is we're going to talk about the movie. And then throughout these things in segment one here, I've taken notes for basically segments two and three. We'll see how it goes. There might be some Mm -hmm. other stuff coming down the line, but definitely uh, a segment beyond segment one. We're going to deconstruct a few of these things and bring in some of the reality behind the movie. So I won't mention that now because I don't want to kind of blow that and I just want to get through the movie. And then the stuff, I wouldn't even tell you what stuff we're going to talk about. So anyway, yeah, we'll start picking it apart later. Yeah. Later segment. So so the movie essentially starts with her planning on a book tour uh, for this latest book. And she's having this crisis of faith, basically, in her career. She never really started out to do this. She doesn't really like doing it. She hates all the fame that uh, she's not really looking for fame, but she also hates that all anybody wants to see is uh, the Channing Tatum character basically take off his shirt. And that's yeah. pretty much it. Like nobody cares about the writing. Nobody cares about the book. And it's just, I mean, they care about the book enough to buy it, but well, and, and it's a good series of books. Apparently they're really involved in the characters, but she's not involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. She's the one who is sort of, you know, looking down on her own books. That's yeah. sort of that place that she's at. Yeah, for sure. And, and the, the the comedy the whole time is actually pretty good. Like she's supposed to be very intelligent and, you know, she's very cerebral in her comments and things like that. And Channing Tatum or Alan is just the exact opposite. Not of that. like he. But so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> sweet and doofy. <laughs> like at least at least two times, I think it was mentioned. He he called her he was he was yelling at her and he said something like you're you're just like a mummy or something like that and she just looks like walking away and he was telling some some cook helper in a kitchen he's like i called her i said she was like a mummy and 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 the cook helper was like mummies are people like she's not like it's not a separate thing he called her a human mummy oh yeah human mummy yeah mummies are human is what the (laughs) 
<laughs> Home document. And then your our cameo we'll talk about later. He actually said the same thing when he was relating the story. He's like, yeah, mummies are human. And, and Alan was like, yeah, I've come to realize that recently. <laughs> and uh, but oh, it's so funny. Just some of the stuff yeah. he does. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. So anyway, the book is called The Lost City of D, which is what the movie is pretty much all about. And mm-hmm. D stands for I wrote it down. She says it really fast, and I had to turn subtitles on to get this right. <laughs> Dapokugio Disfam Ika. Dapokugio Disfam Ika. And there's two hyphens in there somewhere. And yeah. we'll talk about that in a later segment. But that's what D yes. stands for. And she she basically said that according to her writing of this whole thing, the and, and I guess according to her, that's a real name of a place, the European settlers or whatever that first found it couldn't pronounce it so they just called it the lost Mm -hmm. city of d yeah that's what they said so anyway that's where this starts is with that book tour and then she gets all pissed off and she's like i'm gonna leave i don't want to do anything and then as she's standing outside basically waiting for an uber a car shows up and somebody calls out her name and she thinks it's basically her ride and uh, she gets in but she's actually being abducted and Mm -hmm. she's being abducted by harry potter by Harry Potter and he's <laughs> just like Harry Pottering all over it. <laughs> I love mm-hmm. it. Yeah. He did a really good job. Daniel Radcliffe did. It's kind of like the sixth or seventh movie Harry Potter too. He's a little bit angry and a little intense. So Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know what it reminds me of is um Harry Potter when he drinks that potion that makes him feel lucky and he's just kind of like yeah. walking around with a smile on his face, but also kind of a little bit douchey. That's what he reminded me of. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, yeah. So he, she's kidnapped by Harry Potter slash Daniel Radcliffe, whose character name is actually (laughs) Abigail Fairfax. And there's some funny jokes about his name, obviously. (laughs) He's like, yeah, it's one of those gender neutral names, like Leslie or something like that. And she's like, yeah, but it's (laughs) Abigail. (laughs) (laughs) It's really funny. Yeah. So he is interested in, Something from her book where he says, your fictional archaeologist was making translations of a real dead language. So Mm -hmm. in her book, she used some of her experience when she was either an archaeologist or maybe a linguist. I I didn't really get a good idea of what she did before, but definitely translating or something like that. I think because she opens this door in her house at one point when she's trying to finish the book and you get glimpses of it's like her husband's study clearly because he's dead and she's like doesn't open this door go in there. She just left it the way that he left it. So I think Mm -hmm. he was actually the one who was the linguist and maybe she assisted or uh, took part in it. But there's there's clearly like this stereotypical archaeologists like. I don't know, den or study where there's books open all over the place and you can see literally random topics from all over the place. I mean, the real thing about archaeology is most archaeologists who are on the academic side of things will study literally one thing for their entire lives. And Mm -hmm. they're not just like they might be interested in cultures all over the world. But the reality is, from the research standpoint, they are researching like a thing. And mm-hmm. and not he had books open and all over the place of different topics. And you could see different societies from around the world, different writing systems and, and, and writing systems similar to the one that is in this book. I don't know. That's one of the first crazy things in here that happens archaeologically is that not all archaeologists know about everything. I mean, how many times are we with family and they're like, oh, did you hear about that thing in Egypt? I was like, yeah. no. Like, no. what, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's one of the things that I kind of like not struggled with with this movie. But I was like, what are they going for here? Like, is he an archaeologist? Does he work in the yeah. field? Is he a, does he work in a museum? Is he a curator? Is it l- linguistics? Is it, you know, dead languages somehow and translations? Like there's so many different branches of things that a person can be interested in. And they sort of like wrap it all up into one. And yeah. and they also talk about her being the academic who was trying to publish a book about colonization. And so I'm like, so wait, which one of them was the archaeologist or were they both archaeologists and doing it together? Like, I, I don't know. I think they mm-hmm. just sort of like took all of that antiquities researcher thing and just bundled it all in together and and cherry pick the pieces that they wanted for their characters so that's probably one of my biggest criticisms about the characters themselves both her dead husband and her as to Mm -hmm. like what were they exactly (laughs) like what kind of research were they doing yeah 
So, all right, we'll talk about what Harry Potter, I'm just going to keep calling him Harry Potter. We'll talk about okay. what Harry Potter was looking for on the other side of the break. And we'll also talk about the rest of the movie because time has flown by and we are going to end mm-hmm. segment one and go over to segment two. So we'll talk about the crown and the rest of the movie in a minute. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zach's Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Welcome back to episode 172 of the Pop Culture Archaeology Happy Hour. (laughs) I love it. I think we should have more Pop Culture Happy Hour (laughs) <laughs> well wait pop culture archaeology happy hours yes yes we're if for those who don't know we're copying an npr podcast right now which by the way you should go listen to they do great pop culture stuff there oh it is pop culture happy hour that you listen to isn't it i think i wondered it why is. that was in my brain subconsciously i yeah. just came out that way yeah all of my so. pop culture information comes from that podcast <laughs> nice nice all right so the thing that Harry Potter is looking for Abigail, Abigail Fairfax was Uh actually looking for, you know, little little, tiny bit of backstory on him. The reason why he's the villain here is because he's part of like a huge rich family. It's actually the family that owns the publishing house that owns her publisher. So Mm -hmm. that's where this connection comes through. That's why she knows him. And I guess he's got a couple of brothers who are similarly named from the, from what I remember, but I didn't write down their names in my notes. And (laughs) I think one of them actually is a Leslie. I think it was Leslie. And he's younger. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, one of them got control of the company, like it was given to him by his father or something like that. And he's just trying to make a name for himself. They mention in a a really quick line in the movie that, you know, he was the one responsible for trying to raise the Titanic and for uh, something with Atlantis, I think. And, and like all the big buzzwords, like he's been, he's been there trying to make a name for himself, but in like, I guess antiquities and having, he said, he, he also says again in the movie that it's, he wants to own something that nobody else has, you know, is kind of a prestige deal. Yep. Yeah. And I guess his area of interest is in the ancient world. So all these things he keeps trying to possess are ancient things or archaeological sites or artifacts as yeah. in this case it's it's an actual artifact it's the this crown that he's looking for yeah the crown of fire that was supposed to be this king of this small island which we'll get to in a minute he said it was the first major city in the atlantic and i actually tried looking that up and couldn't find anything about the first major city in the atlantic so i'm not really sure nobody's like mm-hmm written about something in those terms so i couldn't find anything but anyway he mentions that he mentions that and then says that this guy was revered by his people i guess he did enough research to know all that but couldn't read the language Mm -hmm. but anyway was revered by his people and they built this huge monument to him and this monument is where the crown of fire this jeweled crown that he assumed the king wore and mm-hmm. and, the, and the people made for him or something like that. And the fire was probably rubies or something like that. So he thought, and that's yeah. what he was looking for. So he wasn't even necessarily wanting to sell it. He was just wanting to own it and possess, possess it, it. And, and be the person yeah. who found it. Yeah. So, which I'm I, really glad that the person with that sort of feelings towards artifacts is the villain in this movie, yeah, you know, cause like yeah. in, in Indiana Jones, and actually I really love that about this movie, Indiana Jones, other movies, they're always hunting some artifact. Now they, the good guys want to protect it or whatever, but like they're always the good guys that are hunting for the artifact. And that's not the kind of thing mindset that we mm-hmm. want in the, the mind of the public about artifacts. It's not how they should right. be handled. It's not the way they should be dealt with. And the fact that he's the villain in this case, it's a little bit of a switch up from how archaeology usually is presented in the movies. And I'm really happy about that. He's the villain because it's bad to take artifacts. Remember that everybody. (laughs) Right. And unlike Indiana Jones or even like Tomb Raider, 
the protagonists are not trying to get the thing instead. They're just like trying to stay alive. Mm-hmm. They're they don't even care yeah. about it. They're just yeah. like whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. In that respect, I actually really liked the way they they did did the movie for sure. Yeah. So the island is. He says it's you know first off the thing I also thought was interesting about the book was um, as any good fiction writer would do. There are some elements of truth to it. Well, in their in their universe, there are some elements of truth to it. She says the tribe was a real tribe. They he, she included symbols, symbols from their language in the book. And that's what gave him notice, because mm-hmm. she had translated some of those symbols. And he said that, as you mentioned earlier, you already read the quote, but, you know, your archaeologist husband was making translations of a dead language. So just to bring that back up. Mm-hmm. So he caught yeah. he her attention that way because he was looking at it and was like, oh, my God. And uh, and it's known as the Lost City of D, which is probably why he picked up the book to begin with. And mm-hmm. the tribe is actually real. People know about that. And it was just like the things that weren't known was. Because I guess there were accounts from Europeans or something, but the things that weren't known was like, where actually is the city? And, you know, what island is it even on? And, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And he found the island and then for the last year has been excavating on that island because he bought the half of the island that the city is supposed to be on. And then they found the city Mm -hmm. and he found another scrap of parchment. They said parchment, which I'm not sure this little island nation would have had parchment, but that's another story. No, Um, and it certainly wouldn't have survived from a from a preservation standpoint on an, a rainforest right. type of island that would definitely have been, you know, yeah. decomposed away unless it was in a bog, I suppose. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah. Not, not too many bogs though when the Dominican Republic. Oh, I'm sorry. Isla yeah. Hundida. Isla Hundida. <laughs> Isla yes. Hundida. Yeah. Which like I said, is actually the Dominican Republic. Should we take a minute to talk about like the location problems with this movie? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, he mentions during this whole setup where he basically tells her everything, you know, it's a small island in the Atlantic called Isla Hundida. And first off, there are not a lot of outside the Caribbean, small, like tropical islands in the Atlantic. I mean, there is some stuff over near the African continent and, you know, up in that area, like the Azores and Mm -hmm. uh, all that stuff's over there. But it's really the Pacific that's known for its like small, random tropical islands. And it's mostly because of the Ring of Fire. They're all volcanic. And this little island is also volcanic. Yeah. So like they they reference the Atlantic and they talk about the Atlantic in the beginning. But then by the time they actually get to the island and then other people are coming to the island to try to rescue them. And, you know, they're talking about going to New Guinea and other Pacific, you know, island yeah. places. So clearly they just had some consistency issues with the writing and just picked the wrong ocean. I think that seems like yeah, what one, happened because it certainly isn't in in the Atlantic. No. And like one guy who's like this cargo pilot was, you know, telling this other woman, he's like, oh, yeah, when we're done here, we'll just hop over to my my cousin's beach that he owns on Hawaii. You know, like it's just yeah. a hop, skip and a jump away. But if you're in the Atlantic, Hawaii is a good 14,000 miles away and yeah, you're not going to exactly. get there super easy. Yeah. So right. so we're kind of even though they said Atlantic, we're we're operating under the assumption that they're in the Pacific. Makes sense because there's a, a volcano on this island and the volcano itself is on the verge of erupting or possibly is actually erupting. And that's where all this rush comes in, because they needed to find the crown well he needed the villain needed to find the crown before it was Mm -hmm. covered in lava so that's where the abduction comes in and you know the way he takes her is very funny and there's a lot of flying charcuterie (laughs) (laughs) and then they fly out to the island so that she can use her expertise to help translate this piece of parchment and then find the crown before the lava covers the whole city yeah it's it's crazy. Yeah, the, that's basically the premise of why there's, like you said, a rush on this whole thing. And I got to mention, yeah. he picks her up. The The flying charcuterie oh, the, is yeah. the reason for that is he picks her up in this plane that doesn't exist. It's <laughs> it's like a corporate jet, but it's vertical takeoff and landing corporate jet, which was a fantastic idea. But it's completely unrealistic because while we have planes that do exactly that, they fly like that, they're military planes. The cost of putting something like that together. They look like yeah. a helicopter, basically, right? The way they, they land and take off. 
Well, they behave like a helicopter. They look like an airplane, but they behave like a helicopter. Yeah, Yeah. that's vertical takeoff and landing. It's called a VTOL aircraft. And like I said, we have several versions of those types of aircraft. The Harrier, the F-22. I mean, we have have jets and things that can do that, but they're billions of dollars. And and to put something together like that for the commercial market, again, would be super cool, but just like doesn't exist yet. So the point you need to know about this is when one of those jets is hovering, unlike a helicopter, which just being supported by its rotors when these things are hovering there is a massive amount of air going through their engines because there's a lot of force it takes to hover that thing and i know this has nothing to do with archaeology or really anything else but i had a huge problem with them (laughs) landing that plane on the beach they landed the plane on the beach vertically and then the plane took off and left from the beach throwing up a huge cloud of sand which would have gone through the intake blown up both engines and they'd have crashed in the (laughs) sea or killed everyone on board so yeah it's so funny it's so funny hearing you talk about that because i legit didn't even notice any of that i was like (laughs) this is probably unrealistic but it's okay it's entertaining and i'm gonna go with it and i feel like that's how it is for any like niche subject that people are interested in and probably most people are looking at the archaeology in this movie and thinking meh it's probably not actually correct but it's close enough and we're just gonna go with it and enjoy the ride (laughs) right right that's just funny so they basically take her immediately to the lost city, the the excavation. And let's talk about the excavation real quick, because the things I noticed about the excavation, just it was a quick pan shot, which is really which is really sad because I don't know if they put that together as a set or went to an actual like, you know, ruins site to actually film yeah. on there. They must have because yeah. unless it was all green screened, because It was just, it it was an extensive excavation and it kind of looked real, but I could see how it could be fake. And I did notice that the, the waste piles, the dirt piles were, were like right in the middle. Like they were on the bulk walls that were in between some of the major (laughs) excavation parts. They weren't like off site somewhere. They were just like right there and leaning up against like one of the dirt piles. I saw the uh, folded up tripod stand of like a like a total station um, mm. tripod stand, which those in themselves are like a thousand dollars. And they've got like 15 fancy tents where they're working and, and living and have all these things. And yet the total station stand is just haphazardly laying against the, the thing right. you're not even in use. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there were no shovels. I don't think I saw any screens. Did you? It sounds like you might have uh, paused it at that moment and like really looked at it closely. I I couldn't do that. I was watching with my parents, but it, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I mean, the other, the other big thing I noted was the city. It was actually pretty deep um, and the walls to the city were kind of high or the residences or whatever. And and it was, Mm -hmm. everything was completely buried. So when they pulled it out, you know, the excavation was actually pretty deep and working for a safety company like I do now, (laughs) <laughs> I noticed there was no shoring anywhere. <laughs> no, why would they? They're in a different country. It was just like completely unsafe. Yeah, but they're probably yeah. funded by American academic institutions, so you know yeah. they gotta follow safety measures. But I don't uh, know. I don't know, man. It was I was in some land. pretty deep pits in in Peru. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, that's where we're at with the uh, with the excavation. He basically zip ties her to a chair and says, "Start translating," and then she's. Yep. She's playing to not being able to translate very well because she doesn't want to give him all the information, which is kind of yep. cool because I you don't realize that at first. You realize that a little bit later on when she just like reads the the essentially hieroglyphs. Um, she reads it just like it's, you know, reading the newspaper. So, yeah, See, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Is she the archaeologist? Was the dead husband the archaeologist? Were they both? Are they you know, into dead languages and translate, like what, Mm -hmm. what do they do? What do they do? What do they actually do? And And I I have a feeling she was right. I have a feeling she was right there with him academically and interest research interest wise before he died. Right. Yeah. And then, and then she just like backslid emotionally into, she was a good writer and backslid emotionally on this book into, well, I'm just going to release this as fiction. And then it just like blew up and her career took another direction that she's not actually happy with. So, yeah. Yeah. So we need to try to somewhat rapidly finish this movie here. So the they hire a guy that Alan knows to help search for him. And this is probably the best cameo in the whole movie, but it's Brad. Oh, Penn. my God. It's the best. And did you notice? <laughs> oh, my God. OK, this is like a tangent right here. But did you notice that when Alan first calls Brad Pitt on the phone, he's literally oh, yeah. eating food? He's eating food. He's chewing food in his mouth because you know what Brad Pitt always does 
eats. He is always eating. I swear to God, go watch your favorite Brad Pitt movie. And I swear to you, he is eating his way yeah. through every scene. Always. Every scene. I did not notice so that. Funny. That's hilarious. He's so yeah. funny. He's clearly chewing something in the phone call. Well, he has it. some pretty great, pretty great little action scenes and, and some one liners. And then, well, I wrote in my notes, he dies like 10 minutes after we meet him, but just watch all the credits to the movie and yeah. you'll, you'll find that that might not be true. So anyway, he, I think it was a little longer than 10 minutes. He, you know, he had some pretty big action scenes and it was mm -hmm. all very entertaining and funny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the rest of this essentially is to be honest, I kind of stopped taking notes. I had some funny stuff that I wrote down, but yeah. th the rest of this is essentially a chase movie. You know, they're, they're yeah. trying to run for their lives and they end up they're Again, they're not even, looking necessarily for this tomb like she she they're just trying to get out and stay safe and stay alive and they ended up getting yeah. caught again after they escape and eventually she has to she does read the symbols and they find out you know she hears a thing in a town there in a village they're in and realizes she actually knows where something mentioned in the symbols actually is and they yep. they end up going to try to find it after all and that's where they intercept again with uh, abigail and, yep. and end up finding the tomb but yeah. just to blow the whole thing here it turns out it was just a fantastic love story between this king and his his bride. And the mm -hmm. crown of fire was actually red seashells and yes. not rubies. So, nope. Yeah. I love it. I yeah. mean, again, like it just shows that, well, maybe, maybe Sandra Bullock and her, her character could have figured out that it wasn't actually like gems. Mm -hmm. But you know, Harry Potter, he just, it was just ridiculous to think that this ancient society had a crown of gemstones. Of course not. They valued the things that were immediately accessible to them and that they could make pretty or that were more valuable for whatever reason, but it was almost never gemstones. It was mm -hmm. shells, shells, red shells probably were harder to get or something. And therefore it just yeah. makes sense that it was the thing that they that they use to make this crown of fire just as an archaeologist that makes absolute sense to me so again i like that that was a fun twist and prehistorically and even historically seashells have been used as currency in mm -hmm. a number of coastal societies because yeah you can assign value to anything and if you yeah. assign value to something that is perhaps rare or takes some processing to make valuable, then that thing will be valuable and people will want it for various reasons. Uh, whether that's yeah. just to, you know, whether the wealthy elite wants it because they want to be pretty, they'll trade for it. They'll do whatever they can for it. You can essentially buy it if you're trading it for other currency. That's mm -hmm. how you buy something is you trade currency for currency or currency for things. And yeah, so it's it's entirely possible that this was an incredibly valuable and prized thing in this society because I think the story she read off the walls, again, reading it fluently, was that he found like a seashell a day while he was courting her and put this thing together. And, yeah. You know, yeah, so anyway. It's a cute story. I like it better than a yeah. dumb ruby headdress or whatever they were hoping it would be. Right. It right. was great. So. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap up this segment and then we'll come back on the other side and tidy up a few of the reality the <laughs> the reality check items in this show. Not that we haven't done it already. I know, we've talked about a couple of them, but we'll we'll do a recap. <laughs> yeah, just a, just a few more things we want to talk about back in a minute. We've got regular live events coming up that we don't want you to miss. Head over to our new parent website, Culturo, and check out the live events calendar. We're ramping it up slowly, so bookmark and check back often. That's culturomedia.com with a K. Once again, that's culturomedia.com. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. 
Want to keep this conversation going? Want to talk to the host of this show and other fans? Then join our membership program and get exclusive access to the hosts, other fans, and early access to these episodes and bonus segments and content. You'll also get forever access to our live show back catalog and any other shows ad-free. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash members for details. That's arcpodnet.com slash members. Welcome back to episode 172 of Crown of Fire. That'd be a great name for a podcast. No, <laughs> the archaeology show. So let's talk about just a couple of the real or not real things in this movie, uh-huh. uh, aside from the location and some other stuff we talked about. I looked up the name of the king, which was like Calaman or something like that. And there are references to that name. I've seen, all, I saw all over the internet, but the primary reference I saw that was blowing it out of the water was from some video game series that I'd never heard of. So oh, really? uh, it was like, a, it was like actually a king or a wizard or something in one of those series. So maybe the writers or somebody were a fan of that series or something and, and they just pulled this name out or something. Hmm. I don't really know. All right. There you go. I know the lost city of D again, I typed it in exactly. And there weren't even search results for this. Like there, <laughs> if I took the hyphens out, there was something like a medical condition that came up, but there weren't even, <laughs> there was like not even a, a partial search for anything related to the name of the city. You know, that second word looks almost a little bit Latin ish. I wonder yeah. if maybe it's Latin or like a different language that they just like, put together in a made up a made up way <laughs> i think someone had a seizure while sneezing and they said depicagio dysphemica well they did that <laughs> and they just wrote maybe. it down so <laughs> maybe yeah. you know i, I know. did research by looking up i just did a google search for city of d basically just to see if oh, okay. that yeah. would come up anywhere and I scrolled through like the first five or six pages of Google, which, as you know, is like a lot of trash once you get past page one. I didn't didn't know there was a sixth page of Google. I know, right? And yeah, there there's just nothing related to an actual place. It 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 was all movie related, so yeah, not a place nor a people. I would imagine. And from that standpoint, it's actually good movie writing because they're not they're not really pulling from anything else. It's just pure fiction. You know, yeah. So, yep. which is impressive these days if you can't even find something partially related to it. I mean, the king's name, I guess that was a little more common as as far as mm-hmm. you know fictional stuff goes. But again, I didn't find anything real related to that. So, right. Anyway, another thing she mentions is when when she's strapped to the chair and told to decipher this, she mentions that the writing system is logographic, and I hadn't. I honestly, I'd probably heard that term before, but it was it was something I actually had to look up because I didn't remember what it meant. And logographic writing systems, again, all the intellectual stuff she says is actually fairly real unless she's talking about the fictional items within the show. Mm. But logographic just means symbols or pictures that represent, you know, words or the um, syllables, basically, okay. you know, of a language. So. So like hieroglyphics, is that kind of the same thing or? Hieroglyphics and cuneiform and, you know, some Chinese characters and the Japanese have three systems of writing actually. And the, the middle one, kind of the middle one is called kanji. And that is basically mm-hmm. the symbolic representation. They have one that's more represents kind of like not, not necessarily individual letters, but again, sounds and things like that. But then kanji really is like words and phrases. And then there's another one that... A whole system of writing just for foreign words and phrases. So Mm. it's crazy. And interestingly enough, when she's talking about, she kind of paraphrases a little bit, but the Wikipedia entry for Logographic basically has a line out of the movie in it. Now, I don't know what came first. (laughs) I'm I'm willing to bet the Wikipedia entry came first and the writers just took it. And she, I don't know. They've done a pretty good job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but something something little like this, like when she's explaining what logographic means, is she basically says, you know, she she doesn't say all the stuff I mentioned about Egyptian and Japanese and Chinese. She basically just says the, you know, represents words and symbols as many hieroglyphic and cuneiform characters. And that last bit is directly out of the Wikipedia entry, like the first <laughs> paragraph. It's just like almost verbatim so what funny. she said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that can't be a coincidence. 
but it's hard. It's a thing that's hard to define in different words than what you just said. So I guess I could see yeah. that. And then one of the other things that comes up in the movie a handful of times, because her and her husband used to say this when they'd finish a particular difficult task, is Dulcius ex asperus, which is Latin for sweeter after difficulties. Or, you know, the more difficult it is, the, the sweeter it's going to be when you're done. But when I first looked up the translation, it said sweeter after prickly, which I really liked. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, I like that. That's great. Yeah, sweeter after prickly. But, but then I looked it up again a little different way, and it came up with difficulties. Hmm. I think we should work that into our into our lives because that's fun. I like that. <laughs> yeah, Dulcius ex mm-hmm. asperus. So, mm-hmm. well, yeah. Uh, anything else on on this movie? No, I mean, we talked about the things that they definitely took a little bit of creative license with. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, I feel okay about all of those things. I think they they didn't try to gloss over or hide the fact that none of this was real. Not really. I mean, it was a funny movie. It was meant to entertain. And nobody's trying to say that any of this stuff was real. In fact, they made the name of the city so ridiculously like long and stupid sounding that I feel like they did that on purpose just to show how (laughs) ridiculous the whole thing is. You know, it it was like one big joke and I am here for that. So it was funny and I liked it. Yeah. I need to go find the outtakes for this movie. I know, right. I'm trying to say that totally. Yeah. One last thing that I want to talk about. And just as we're recording this today, I happen to randomly see a news article about a new movie trailer for a movie coming out in August that's going straight to streaming. And I think it's coming to Hulu or something like that. The movie is called Prey, and it's the latest movie Ooh. in the Predator series. So, you know, oh. the original the original Predator took place in, I think it was in Vietnam, but not during Vietnam. It was over there somewhere, and it was like Arnold Schwarzenegger and his crew, and they were battling this alien, you know, this alien being, this Predator. And then I never, I don't think I ever saw any of the additional movies, but there was another one, and then there was like Alien versus Predator, which is kind of a crossover. And then there was there was one not too long ago. This one takes place in the 1700s in North America, and the, the it's the Comanche Indians fighting the predator. Oh, so I'm calling it alien. I'm calling it pre- predator versus Native Americans. <laughs> oh my god! Wow, and apparently, that is an interesting way yeah. to go with it. <laughs> apparently, the producers were quoted as saying they tried to represent. Native American tribal aspects in life and people as accurately as possible. And one of the ways they did that was hiring authentic Native American and First Nations actors and actresses. And mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, that's not the only thing that does it, because, of course, you know, the only way to make Native Americans authentic is to invoke aliens, of course, like actual aliens. <laughs> so this is not going to help our cause. And we're going to have to talk about right. this because literally everybody is going to tear this movie to shreds if it ever comes to light. Yeah. It's already done. Oh, I'm they've, sure they will. Yeah. The, the trailer's not quite done, I don't think, because the trailer was basically showed nothing. And it was, I think, 30 seconds long. So, mm-hmm. um yeah. And I'm just going to go ahead and say right now, you're not going to get me to watch all of the previous movies. I have zero oh, interest terrible. in watching them. Yeah. I'm not going to start now. <laughs> 38 years old. I haven't watched them. I'm not starting now. Get off my planet. I'm sure that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> says. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's been a long time since I saw the first Predator. I mean, a long time. Like, I was a kid. It was. It had to have been the late 80s, early 90s or something. I don't know. It must have been. So, yeah. I yeah. don't know. Not again, for me. I never thank really, you. I know. I never even saw any of the later ones, I don't think. Uh, maybe one of them, but definitely didn't see Alien versus Predator. I never kept up on the Alien franchise either. So. That is the only one I saw, and it was terrible. So, Well, you didn't have the backstory. <laughs> not that no, it would have been I better didn't. with it. but No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Sorry for the uh, movie review, but it's recent and we just had to do it. I, I know some people, we've had some feedback that they like would just prefer real archaeology. But I feel like one of the things about this show is not only are we talking about current news and the way that is taken through the lens of media, but also archaeology has represented in certain media yeah. aspects. And that happens to be movies and TV shows sometimes. And it's, yeah. it's good to talk about it. It's very important to to look at how we're portrayed in pop culture because it's influencing right. the next generation of archaeologists. So I think it's really yeah. important to look at that and Absolutely. critique it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
Hey, for our members, we have a bonus segment. So if you head over to your member pages at arcpodnet.com and you just click on members up at the top and you actually don't go to the bonus content link, just go to the regular link for high quality or ad free downloads. And on the show right there, there will now be two audio blocks. And that's how we're doing bonus segments for shows now. We're not separating the bonus from the show because... Well, separate people don't have access to that. You have access to all of it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it goes with the show. So it makes sense to put it together. Yeah. So check that out and check out the bonus segment. For those of you that are not members, head over to arcpodnet.com forward slash members to check it out. This bonus segment is about a real lost city, perhaps, that was maybe kind of found, maybe not. And (laughs) (laughs) we'll talk about that. Yeah. That sounds really wishy-washy, but like that's actually the situation. So... (laughs) That's that's actually the reality with Lost Cities, yes. Yeah, definitely. All right, with that, thanks to our members for supporting us, and thanks to all of our new members that are signing up right now. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.arcpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks for listening. Please consider joining our growing core of members over at arcpodnet.com slash members. If you liked what you heard, consider leaving a review wherever you're listening to this. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply.